On islands scattered across the Pacific, men of two nations fight for their lives. At stake, Axis world domination and America under the threat of invasion. Here, the war comes down to this, soldier against soldier, guns in their hands. Now, the anatomy of a gunfight. We're boots on the ground in World War II, and this is Shootout, the Pacific. Macon Atoll, 1942. It's one of the first face-to-face -face meetings on the ground between the US and Japan. Marine raiders blasting away against Japanese killers. The firefight against the enemy is part of the first American campaign against Japan on the ground. Well-armed Marine raiders are eager for battle. The Marine Raiders had such superior firepower that they had confidence that they could overwhelm any Japanese force they encountered. For six months after Pearl Harbor, the news had been nothing but bad. America and its allies pushed back as Japan launched a killing spree that engulfed millions. That was then. Now, in August 1942, American Marines suddenly challenged the enemy on land. Here's the background. The raid on Macon is unprecedented. Shrouded in secrecy, the Marines have been delivered by the Argonaut and Nautilus, two of the Navy's largest submarines. But with 222 raiders on board, the subs are packed solid. A thousand miles away, Americans are storming the beaches of Guadalcanal. The strike on Macon is designed to distract the enemy and keep him guessing. The Macon raid was conducted to basically deceive the Japanese into believing that there were additional landings other than the Guadalcanal landings that were taking place. The Macon raid uh, took place 10 days after the initial landings at Guadalcanal. Leading the 2nd Marine Raider Battalion is 46-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Evans Carlson, son of a Congregationalist minister. Carlson believes teamwork is the key to making it through the war alive. Evans Carlson had spent some time with the Chinese Communist forces in 1937, and he coined a phrase um, called gung ho. He actually introduced that word into English, and it means work in harmony. Gung ho becomes the battalion's creed. Carlson's executive officer is Major James Roosevelt, son of the president. They lead the raiders toward the raid on Macon. Here's the matchup, the American Marine. He's about 19 years old. He's highly trained and well-led, but has never been in battle. On the other side, the Japanese soldier, in his 20s. Chances are he's already seen lots of action. He's lightly armed, but believes he's invincible. The Japanese are armed with a few machine guns and 6.5 millimeter bolt action rifles. Their weapons are no match for the Americans with their M1 Garand semi-automatic rifles and quick-to-fire portable machine guns like the Browning automatic rifle. August 17, 1942, 5.30 a.m., Butari Tari Island in the Macon Atoll. 222 Marines hit the beaches in rubber boats and hustle to unload and move inland. Butari Tari Island is barely half a mile wide, and the Marines move quickly across the distance. It's 222 Marines against 45 Japanese, but intelligence is sketchy. Estimates could be wrong. As many as 160 of the enemy may be here. They assumed that we would have about a two to one ratio of attackers versus defenders. So that would have meant that there was about 100 Japanese on the island. 
But the Japanese have no plans to run when the Marines come knocking. Local Commander Sergeant Major Kanemitsu Hisamitsu responds to a general alert issued by Tokyo after the invasion of Guadalcanal and prepares his men for any American attack. First platoon of Marine Company A, about 30 men, splits off and crosses the island from south to north. Here, natives tell them the Japanese are assembling about a mile down the island to the west. The platoon is led by 2nd Lieutenant Wilfred Le Francois, a man they call Frenchy. Le Francois was a, a maverick. He came up through the ranks, an old China Marine. He was well liked by the people because he, he'd been through everything you could go through as a, as a Marine. The confrontation will put 60 Marines up against 50 Japanese. Here's the setup. Le Francois has one platoon of 30 men on direct advance. There's another platoon nearby, giving the Marines 60 for the shootout. About 75 yards in front of them, the Japanese have four machine gun nests. A dozen enemy snipers are set up in the trees. And about 25 infantrymen are boarding a truck that will rush them to the fight. Lieutenant Le Francois advances, deploying his men in a wedge formation, as effective against an opposing line on the battlefield as it is in football. The wedge is an effective formation that's been used for centuries. It provides effective firepower on all sides, in the front, the left, and right flank. And it's used uh, by the Marines even today to attack enemy forces. In an engagement like this, the commander who lets loose with the most fire first usually wins and Le Francois knows it. His scouting party suddenly saw a Japanese truck pull up about 300 yards down the road and 10 to 25 Japanese piled out of this truck. Here's how the battlefield shapes up. Le Francois organizes a firing line to ambush the Japanese. He orders men from the flanks to move forward, creating a cul-de-sac facing the approaching enemy. When the Japanese walk into it, they'll be torn apart by fire coming from multiple directions. Sergeant Clyde Thomason is a key player, taking over once the lieutenant issues his orders. Sergeant Clyde Thomason was a, what we would call a good old boy from Atlanta, Georgia. He was a career Marine. He had served in China. He knew how to operate men. He could get people where they needed to be, when they needed to be there. Thomason keeps his men down and quiet. The Japanese approach. They do not see the Americans, but the Americans can see them. The trap is waiting to be sprung. Sergeant Thomason waited until the approaching Japanese were about 30 yards away. The tension among the Marines on the line must have been unbearable as they waited for the enemy to come closer and closer and closer before the first trigger was pulled. Thomason cradles his 12-gauge shotgun, the personal defense weapon he was allowed to choose as a non-commissioned officer. At just the right moment, with every man in the line ready, he shouts the order, let him have it. Withering fire from the Marine line cuts down the advancing Japanese like grass in the blades of a mower. But the shootout is far from over. There's a problem. There are a dozen enemy snipers and four machine guns hidden in the vegetation. On cue, the Japanese open up on the Marines. Instead of taking cover, Sergeant Thomason works his way up and down the firing line, fine-tuning it to meet the threat. He courageously exposes himself to fire, staying focused on the battle. One thing that he did was get moving people up closer to where they could get a better sight of what's going on. And he was up there, hey, move up, get over here. Uh, get a better shot. Uh. 
from where I was laying. I saw him a couple times moving, and then he was down, and that was the end of that. A sniper nailed him. Sergeant Clyde Thomason is the first to fall, but he is by no means the last. August 17, 1942, 7 a.m. Make an atoll in the mid-Pacific. A platoon of U.S. Marines is locked in a deadly shootout with 50 Japanese killers. The Americans have crossed the half-mile width of Butari Tari Island after landing on its southern shore. Now, the enemy is in their faces. A dozen snipers in the trees pour lead on the Marines. The Marines spot the threat, zero in, and let it fly. Four enemy machine guns are also threatening the Marines. Japanese gunners struck by American bullets are quickly replaced. And the fire continues nonstop. Marine Corporal Lewis Chapman and his crew takes on one nest in what becomes a machine gun to machine gun duel. Chappie, as they call him, aims at the enemy nest 50 yards away. His Browning light machine gun fires from a 250 round belt fed from the side. Japanese machine guns are fed from 30 round strips and are more difficult to reload. Chappie has to fire 400 rounds, but in this shootout, he's the one who comes out the winner. We had that low air-cooled machine gun. When you got it set up, it was probably about a foot, not more than a foot off the ground, the whole thing. The Japanese had machine guns that were set up above the ground, and in order for the men to fire it, they had to expose themselves. And this is why Chappie did such a good job on those people. More than a dozen Japanese bodies are found in the machine gun nest, a testament to the determination they had in keeping their gun blasting away. Then, without warning, the Japanese launch two bonsai charges as dozens of soldiers swarm the battlefield. It's a human wave, hell-bent on killing. The Japanese mindset was to attack, attack, attack at that point in the war. They were devoted to the warrior spirit, and they felt that the warrior spirit could overcome any obstacle. So they would not hesitate to launch a charge into superior firepower, feeling that their warrior spirit would prevail, which of course it did not. The charging Japanese are annihilated, and they run out of men to reinforce their line. The guns peter out. The shootout didn't last over 20 minutes, from the first sniper shot to the final charge by the enemy and uh, the wipeout. 14 Americans have been killed in the firefight, but as many as 160 Japanese have been slaughtered. The Marines don't realize it, but they have virtually destroyed the entire enemy garrison on Butari Tari. But rough seas keep the Marines stranded on the beach for two days, losing most of their weapons in failed attempts to rejoin the submarines. Carlson is so despondent, he contemplates surrender, not knowing there are no Japanese to surrender to. In the end, the men do make it back to the Nautilus and Argonaut. 
they took names, and the American people know it. I think that the men did their job on the raid, and they did it well. But the raid clearly didn't achieve what it was set out to do, which was to divert the Japanese attention. It gets worse. Nine Marines have been accidentally left behind. They are captured by Japanese who arrive after the raid and are beheaded under orders of an admiral later executed as a war criminal. Nearly a year after the Macon raid, Americans are 200 miles west of Guadalcanal on New Georgia in the Solomon Islands chain. It is the next step in America's march toward Japan. July 19th, 1943, 3 p.m., New Georgia in the Solomon Islands. A machine gun squad, about six men, from the 4th Marine Raider Battalion, is in reserve, waiting for orders in an assault on Bairoko, a harbor on New Georgia's coast. It's 800 Marines against 1,400 Japanese. Here's the battleground. Bairoko Harbor is located on the northwest corner of New Georgia. Directly in front of it is a band of heavy Japanese defenses. The Marines are advancing one mile from the east, and a line thick with Japanese machine gun nests is holding them up. The Marine machine gun squad that was waiting in reserve now gets the word to move out. They wanted our squad, along with a lieutenant by the name of Corbett and his runner, to take us around and hopefully behind these machine guns and dispose of them so that the rest of the battalion could go forward. Olin Gray is a 20-year-old private, an assistant gunner in the Marine squad, whose primary weapon is the Browning light machine gun. He and the others in the six-man squad hope to get in position for a flank attack on the Japanese machine guns. It is exactly what the operation needs. The flank attack is one of the most sought after attacks in infantry tactics, simply because you're firing straight into your enemy's side, and therefore, if he turns to face you, the people that he'd been firing with are then firing into his side. So he's kind of caught in a, a double 90 degree hammer, if you would. It's six Marines going after 18 Japanese. The Americans are walking into an ambush. Here's the setup. Three Japanese machine guns are hidden in the jungle around an open area, one at the 10 o'clock position, one at the 12 o'clock position, and one at the 2 o'clock position. 175 yards away, the Marines advance into the clearing with 200 yards of open space in front of them. They let us get halfway out, halfway across this open space before they opened up. And that's when uh, the crap hit the fan. In a matter of minutes, everyone in the squad is either killed or wounded. Private Olin Gray is the only Marine able to fight. Olin Gray is a Marine alone, outnumbered and outgunned. Japanese fire is coming straight at him. He has no idea if it's safe to retreat, so Olin Gray does the only thing he can do to survive. July 20th, 1943, 4 p.m., New Georgia, Solomon Islands. Private Olin Gray is the only Marine left standing in a six-man shootout against 18 Japanese. He's pinned down by fire from three Japanese machine guns in a clearing near Bairoko Harbor. Bairoko is on the northwest coast of the island and is protected by rings of strong defenses, including the machine gun nests now shooting right at Private Gray. Everything happened so fast. When all this started, I know it hit the ground and I got a hold of a machine gun, a couple boxes of ammunition, and uh, loaded her up, and uh, I could tell pretty well where the fire was coming from. 
Machine guns on both sides routinely fire tracer rounds every third shot. It helps the gunner to aim his fire, but it also helps the other side to locate the gun. Gray can spot two nests ahead and to the left and is sure there's a third to the right. The tripod for Gray's machine gun, normally carried by the squad leader, is missing. Incredibly, he holds the gun in his arms and fights back. Olin Gray almost becomes Rambo, essentially, picking up his 30 caliber light machine gun and directing the fire at these bunkers that are firing at him. He's standing up the whole time and firing. And that's an extremely difficult thing to do. Well, without a tripod, I had a machine gun in the crook of my arm and was firing it with my right hand. And when it ran out, I had to stop, open the breech, and to start another belt through. His Browning light machine gun weighs 31 pounds and spits out eight rounds per second. But Gray must fire in short spurts only, so the gun won't jam from overheating. For two hours, he fires burst after burst at the enemy, standing in one spot and hardly changing positions at all. The main reason I had for moving was to be able to pick up another box of ammunition, and open it, and started in the gun. Standing up that long in plain sight and not being killed, somebody up there was looking after me. And I do believe that sincerely. There's nothing in Marine Corps training that probably would have prepared Olin Gray to do what he did. But I think that this is um, an example of just an ordinary individual, an ordinary American doing something extraordinary. I didn't have a plan at all. My only plan was to keep alive and get it out of there some way with my skin. The only thing I was interested in was saving this old boy's hide. In Olin's shootout, the best defense is a good offense. He began the fight with 2,000 rounds of ammunition, and by dusk, he has just half a belt left, no more than 125 shots. Across the clearing, two Japanese machine guns are silent. A few of Olin Gray's rounds, just enough, got the job done. He slips into the jungle for cover during the night and will get the order to withdraw by morning. Despite Olin Gray's personal victory, the Americans need another five weeks to finish taking New Georgia. The Japanese successfully evacuate thousands of troops before Bairoko Harbor finally falls on August 28, 1943. In the next year, the Allies remain relentless in pressing against Japan's Pacific perimeter. By 1944, they take New Guinea, and General Douglas MacArthur's drive to return to the Philippines is in full throttle. 500 miles east of the Philippines is the island of Peleliu in the Palau Archipelago. 20,000 men in the 1st Marine Division invade on September 15, 1944. Some say the Japanese there threaten MacArthur's flank. Others say the island should be bypassed. The only thing everyone agrees upon is whatever goes down here will be ugly. I've always taken the position that they weren't going to give the 1st Marine Division the weekend off, and that if we weren't going to land on Peleliu, we were going to land someplace else, who knows where, and therefore we were given a job to do and we did it. September 19, 1944, 2.30 p.m. Peleliu Island. Captain Everett Pope is getting ready to take a position called Hill 100, but it won't be easy. He commands a Marine company seriously depleted by battle. Captain Pope landed on Peleliu with about 240 men. In the two days before the assault on Hill 100 on September 19th, the company had been in some serious fighting, and Pope was down to 90 men by the time he received orders to seize the hill. Hill 100 is identified as a high point on a ridge in the central part of Peleliu. The high ground is always important in military campaigns, so Pope is given the assignment and follows through, despite the fact that so many of his buddies have been killed. Well, in most cases, when you don't have a steady stream of replacements, 
and there are objectives that need to be taken, the, uh, the Marines push forward. Suddenly, as many as 600 Japanese in the surrounding heights pummel the hillside with shells and gunfire. Going up the slopes, Pope's men carry only light weapons. Well, we were armed as a rifle company. Many, most of the men are armed with rifles. We had some light machine guns with us, but uh, we had nothing special. They also have almost no ammunition. A rifleman normally carries about 28 round clips for his semi-automatic M1 Garand, but these men, at this moment, have close to zip. We did not have any was near the amount of fire that we normally would have had because we had fought all day. Heading up the steep slope, the men are hardly in a position to fight back. The only tactic they can employ is simply to spread out and hope they don't get shot. We were trained enough in combat to know that you stay as separate from each other as is possible in any combat situation. And in going up this hill, uh, we did just that. And then it just became a mad dash for the top and the devil take the hindermost. Pope and his men reach the hilltop, but at a terrible cost. 65 men are lost on the way up. At the top, it gets worse. It's 25 Marines facing 100 Japanese. Well, when we got to the top of the hill, we found a situation that we really hadn't expected to find. There was a flat area on the top of that hill, and I've described it as perhaps the size of a tennis court. And unfortunately, it was not the highest elevation. There was a higher elevation beyond us, which enabled the enemy to look down at us. Now, the maps were incorrect. We did not know that that's the way it would be. And we found ourselves in a tough position with the enemy able to look down and fire down at us as we gathered together what were left of us on this plateau. Taking cover wherever they can, the Marines prepare to hold the ground. The Japanese will wait until night to strike back. Pope and his men have only the ammo they carried with them. None of them knows how long they can hold out. September 19, 1944, 8 p.m. Peleliu Island. Nightfall in the South Pacific. The place is a position called Hill 100, a high point on the ridge in the middle of the island. Japanese artillery hammers the two dozen Marines who have taken the hilltop during the day. In an area the size of a tennis court, they take whatever defensive positions they can find, waiting for the enemy to attack. It's four Japanese against every Marine. We just did the best we could to find places to set up the machine guns to put the riflemen down, to stay out of trouble as best we could. We knew we were in big trouble. Here's the battlefield. Company commander Captain Everett Pope and his men cannot dig in on the hard surface. They arrange themselves to find whatever cover they can. Ahead of them is an incline leading to a higher elevation, where the Japanese are in a perfect position to attack. At least 100 enemy are thought to have direct sight of the Americans, perhaps many more. So far, the Japanese have been firing from a distance. But now, they get personal. In the course of the night, the Japanese launched several counterattacks against Pope. These were not bonsai charges. These were, were calculated careful counterattacks by experienced soldiers. Amid the shell bursts and gunfire, the battle devolves into face-to-face -face fighting that could not have been more raw. Two Japanese come out of nowhere. 
They attack Lieutenant Francis Burke and Sergeant James McAlarns. The men on both sides have rifles in their hands, but this is too close for shooting, and bayonets take over. Burke gets a Japanese blade in the leg. Burke explodes in a rush of adrenaline, beating his assailants senseless with nothing more than bare fists. McAlarnus bludgeons the other Japanese with the butt of his rifle, in a hatred magnified by the lens of war. The Marines are taught to kill. They engage the enemy and they kill them, and that's something that the Marine Corps is known for. Against Japan, they faced a ruthless foe. There was no quarter given on either side in the Pacific War. It was either kill or be killed. McAlarnus and Burke have no time to savor victory. The two Marines heave the enemy corpses down the steep hill and return to battle. For a time, the Marines hold their own, but their supplies are critically low, especially ammunition. Infantry, whether it's a division or a squad, can fight for a day or two without food, and they can fight, depending on the climate, for maybe an hour or two without water. She can't fight for five minutes without ammunition. The Marines hang on by a thread throughout the night. Grenades are an important weapon, but they're so short in supply, the men resort to throwing rocks at the Japanese, creeping up the hill toward them. It's a clever tactic throw a rock down the hill as the enemy advances. Throw rocks down the hill three times, and each time the Japanese, thinking it's a grenade, will dive for cover. But if by chance they see the rock, they'll probably curse the Marines for the trick. Sooner or later, though, it won't be a rock. The real grenade will explode. And even if it doesn't kill or wound anyone, it keeps the enemy at bay, slows them down. The Marines hang on, but by morning, only nine of them remain alive, and almost 100 Japanese infantry are preparing a major assault. The only safe place is within American lines, down the hill to the rear. And we realized at that point we'd better get off this hill. And uh, as we were getting ready to get off, battalion ordered us to come off. And so we just beat it down to the bottom of the hill. Everybody except me was wounded. Uh, and I was immediately hit when I got down to the bottom of the hill. I was hit by artillery. And there's the slightest doubt that it was our own artillery trying to fire over our head, but had a short round or two. And uh, that, that causes a lot of casualties. Captain Pope's stand on Hill 100 is heroism to the extreme in a losing gunfight. Another two months are needed to defeat the Japanese on Peleliu. 1,252 Americans are killed. The Japanese lose their entire garrison, nearly 11,000 dead. The lopsided numbers are typical of the Pacific War, where Japanese prefer death to surrender or capture. In the next year, the Allies tighten the noose around Japan. By 1945, MacArthur returns to the Philippines. When Manila and other principal targets are taken, Americans chase the Japanese to northern Luzon, where a six-week fight develops in the mountains on the Villa Verde Trail. March 10, 1945, 3 a.m. Villa Verde Trail in the Philippines. Private First Class Thomas Atkins of the U.S. Army's 32nd Infantry Division is with two buddies awaiting orders for the next day. They are part of a platoon in position on a slope above the trail. Their only shelter is the hole they've dug with their entrenchment tools. The expression is foxholes, but that connotates a round circle and deep. And we didn't do that. We made slit trenches, which is... Uh, the length of a soldier and the width of two or three soldiers. It's 30 Americans against 175 Japanese. 
Here's the setup. The Japanese are getting ready to attack, two companies strong. Their plan is to sneak forward and find a place to break through the Army platoon's perimeter. And right now, they have their sights set on the foxhole where Atkins and his two pals are on guard. It was nighttime when this action took place, and it would have commenced by three or four Japanese crawling up, not standing, but trying to crawl up to uh, approach the position. The shootout begins. The three GIs in the foxhole pour out as much lead as their M1 Garands will shoot. But more Japanese join in, and the Americans are nearly overwhelmed. It's the worst case scenario. Both of his companions are shot dead, and Atkins is suddenly alone. He himself has taken three enemy bullets. No one would blame him for falling back, but he ignores the pain, keeps his eye on the ball, and doesn't even think of retreat. The Japanese will keep coming, and Atkins will point his M1 and fire to hold them off. He's fighting solo, but he'll keep it up all night long. March 10th, 1945, 4 a.m. Villa Verde Trail, the Philippines. Private First Class Joseph Atkins has been shot three times. His two buddies are dead. He has been fighting alone for over an hour. Atkins is on Luzon, the northernmost of the Philippines' major islands, where the Japanese are trying to stop the U.S. Army. His foxhole in the Philippine mountains bears the brunt of a Japanese attack by 175 men, trying to pulverize a single American platoon. The only thing Atkins has to keep the enemy at bay is his rifle, an M1 Garand. I think the M1 Garand was one of the weapons that won World War II for the Allies. I mean, it was a key weapon. The standard issue rifle through most of the war, the M1 Garand fires from an eight round clip. But unlike Japanese rifles, which are all slower bolt action weapons, the M1 is semi-automatic. It shoots every time Atkins pulls the trigger, allowing him to get off as many as eight shots in quick succession. But even with this weapon, Atkins is only one man, and 175 Japanese are waiting, feeding men into the line of fire all night. The pressure is intense. I think he was focused like a laser beam. Just put the horse blinders on, and he was focused entirely on trying to, to basically shoot at anything that was coming at him. Here's the shooting ground. Atkins' foxhole is one of a half dozen or so arranged roughly in a semicircular perimeter on the mountainside. A lieutenant, radio man, medic, and perhaps others are positioned in a center core, 20 to 50 yards to the rear of the perimeter. 175 Japanese soldiers are an unknown distance ahead of them. Only the darkness and rough terrain keep them from attacking as a large group. They'd have to come up almost nose to nose, I would guess, uh, eight to 10 yards. It was almost hand to hand, real close in fighting. The M1's rapid fire works for Atkins, who can barely see the enemy as they approach. Private Atkins was firing at shapes and sounds. But what would happen was you'd have to fire a number of shots just to make sure that you hit something you knew the enemy was closing in on you, and you didn't want him to get any closer. Atkins M1 jams unexpectedly. Frantically, he ducks into his slit trench and grabs the weapon dropped by one of his dead pals. The ammo, too. 
He needs every clip he can lay his hands on. In order to maintain his position, he just stayed there and fired like hell. The second rifle also jams, but there is one more in the trench. Atkins grabs it. He shoots at anything that moves. Laying low, avoiding enemy fire. Staying alive. Atkins will fire 400 rounds, reloading his rifle 50 times in his four-hour shootout with the enemy. An incredible feat by almost any standard. He fired 400 rounds in approximately four hours. That's around every 36 seconds. Whereas a normal rifleman probably would fire seven to 10 rounds per week. You know, Tony Atkins was a farm boy from South Carolina, and he probably had a rifle on the farm. So uh, he could probably do things others couldn't do. So that's why uh, I'm not surprised. By 7 a.m., 13 Japanese dead are scattered in front of Atkins' position. His last rifle has jammed. He is nearly out of ammo. There's a lull in the fighting, so he heads to the rear for another weapon and more bullets. But the medic makes him stay. The wounds he so bravely ignored need treatment. Suddenly, he sees a single Japanese penetrating the perimeter. A rifle is within reach. Moments later, he's in the care of Igorots, indigenous mountain people who, like the natives all across the Pacific, help the allies by carrying supplies and the wounded. It's almost certain that Igorots would have had to carry him back. The reason being, there was no manpower. We shorthanded. We had casualties. He was wounded. But even on the litter, he is alert. He suddenly looks up and sees a Japanese squad approaching the platoon's rear. Atkins still has a rifle. He sits up and fires off a clip. It's enough to drive the enemy off. The battle is over. And now, finally, Private Atkins can get the break he needs. Tommy Atkins' accomplishments were extraordinary truly heroic, truly unusual. Tommy Atkins is recognized for his bravery with the Medal of Honor. He survives the war, as does Olin Gray, who receives the Distinguished Service Cross for his solo shootout with Japanese machine gunners on New Georgia. Lieutenant Wilfred Lefrancois, leader of a Marine platoon on Macon, earns the Navy Cross for his bravery. He survives World War II, but is later killed in Korea. And Sergeant Clyde Thomason, the first to fall on Macon, is awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously. The nation's highest award is also worn by Everett Pope, who survives the horrific defense of Peleliu's Hill 100, as well as the war. I'm wearing this medal because I respect the men whom, whom I led. I'm not sure that I did anything personally to deserve it, but you've heard the expression, I was not a hero, but I was among heroes. And that's why I wear this medal. I wear it very proudly, very proudly. World War II ends in a spectacular fashion with a weapon of mass destruction. But reaching that point has been at the end of a gun as soldiers bear witness to their personal confrontations, looking the enemy in the eye and fighting for survival in the shootouts of the Pacific War. This program contains real and reenacted violent combat scenes. Viewer discretion is advised.
1,300 U.S. Marines close in on the Iraqi city of Nazaria. Their mission? Seize two bridges for follow-up forces to cross on their way to Baghdad. But lying in wait within the city are 5,000 Saddam Hussein loyalists hidden in homes and on side streets and determined to annihilate the Americans. Here now is the anatomy of an ambush, shot-by-shot shot accounts of deadly gunfights never before told. As the ferocious shootout for Nazaria erupts, the blood of U.S. troops will darken the pavement of Iraq's ambush alley. March 23, 2003. Highway 7, one mile south of Nazaria, Iraq. 6.30 a.m. Sergeant Matthew Rose of the U.S. Army's 507th Maintenance Company is fighting exhaustion and struggling to keep his eyes focused on the road. His supply truck is fourth in line in an 18-vehicle, 33-man maintenance convoy pushing its way north across the Iraqi desert. Many of the trucks weigh up to five tons, but they offer little protection for the soldiers inside. We're not driving armored vehicles. You know, it's just a, a truck. Um, and I can tell you, a bullet will go right through the door of a five ton. The maintenance company is desperately trying to catch up to its parent unit, the 3rd Infantry Division, after falling well behind because of mechanical problems. Now it's missed a critical turn and is steering directly into Nazaria, a southern Iraqi city nestled on the banks of the Euphrates River. Sergeant Rose doesn't know it yet, but his tiny convoy is headed for a hornet's nest. The unit crosses the Euphrates Bridge and actually makes it the two and a half miles north through the city before realizing its error. At some point in time, the commander decided that our best course of action would be back through Nasiriya. The soldiers turn their trucks around and head back south. They're just one mile from the southern edge of town when gunfire erupts at the head of the column. I realized that there was a guy 25 feet off the road. He was trying to kill me. It was just a kind of an odd realization as you're driving along. Wow, someone's really trying to kill me. Some convoy passengers use their M16s to shoot out the truck windows, but most have never heard a shot fired in anger, and they are stunned by this unexpected attack. I remember that I just started praying, you know, this is, you know, it's not my time. I don't, I don't want to die now. The convoy drivers step on the gas as dozens of Iraqis armed with AK-47 assault rifles and rocket-propelled grenades fire from balconies and doorways at the edges of the road. The convoy started breaking up as vehicles are getting hit and starting to break down. Vehicles that are still mobile make their way back across the Euphrates Bridge and limp south under RPG and machine gun fire. Three miles from town, as more trucks take disabling shots, six soldiers from the convoy help four wounded men to cover several dozen yards from the roadway. The six able-bodied troops form a defensive perimeter around their wounded and, for the next hour, use their M16s to fend off dozens of Iraqi fighters advancing from the city across open fields. Few of the Americans expect to survive the day. 8 a.m. Four miles south of the struggling 507th survivors, the men of 1st Battalion, 2nd Marine Regiment are themselves approaching Nazaria. They're on a mission to prevent a potential attack from the city and to clear a route through the town if necessary. They are completely surprised when they encounter U.S. Army soldiers ahead of them. Somebody said that they have made liaison with some army soldiers that were on the ground. And 
A lot of us monitoring the radio thought that was really weird because we were the forwardmost unit, or at least so we were told, we're the forwardmost spearhead that's going into the city. No one was supposed to be in front of us. Battalion leaders send tanks along with two Amtraks from Alpha Company to see what's going on. An Amtrak is the Marine Corps' light armored troop carrier. What they find doesn't look good. Five burning supply trucks litter the road. The vehicles were shot up, windscreen shot up with holes, uh, doors open, blood pouring from the seats in the cab down to the ground, uh, bullet casings, abandoned weapons, just a, a sight that really catches your attention. Some two and a half miles south of town, the tanks take fire from distant enemy vehicles and engage. Meanwhile, the Amtraks continue their search for the soldiers. One of the Marines in charge is then Gunnery Sergeant Justin LaHue. My driver, PFC Sasser, noticed some guys in the field waving their arms in the air, and they were American troops. Their casualties that were the worst off were in the center of their little circles, and they were somewhat putting up a defense. Gunny LeHue and First Sergeant James Thompson leap from an Amtrak and move toward the soldiers. The troops are in a ravine and still under fire. First Sergeant James Thompson, uh, he starts putting him into the back of the vehicle, and I, at the time, start climbing up onto the side of the vehicle and get up in the weapon station, traverse the weapon station in the direction the firing starting to come from, and then fire the 50 cal into the fields out there. We did that, they stopped firing real quick. That kind of let them know, hey, there's, there, there's bigger people here to deal with. The soldiers in the ravine breathe a collective sigh of relief. We start loading these guys. I mean, these guys had AK-47 rounds stuck on their shoulders, their arms just had like shirts torn off their bodies and tied around them. They were like so thankful that we showed up. And I mean, these guys were like, thank you, you know, I love you. I've had a friend from high school that was a Marine, and I often tease him about being a Marine. At that point in time, I loved the Marines. They were my favorite people. The two Marine Amtraks carry the Army soldiers to safety. But this is not how the operation at Nazaria was supposed to start, with the rescue of a lost convoy. And worse, there are 15 to 20 soldiers still missing. It's unknown if they are dead or in the hands of the Iraqis. Controlling Nazaria is critical. The city occupies a key strategic location, and the two main thrusts of the invasion will have to move by it on their way to Baghdad. One Marine column will come close to the outskirts of the city. To ensure the route is open, a separate Marine task force led by 1st Battalion 2nd Marines will rush forward and seize two bridges, one over the Euphrates River at the south end of Nazaria, and one over a canal at the city's northern limit. The road between the bridges is lined with buildings, and less optimistic planners have dubbed the thoroughfare Ambush Alley. In my opinion, if they wanted to block that road with a couple of donkey carts and a pile of rocks, they could have done it and kept us there. We planned for that being an easy trap. The Marine plan is to avoid the road by skirting around the east side of the city. Here's the setup. 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines has three infantry companies, Alpha Company, Bravo Company, and Charlie Company, along with a company of tanks. Alpha Company will lead the way, taking the first bridge, which spans the Euphrates River. The tank company will support Alpha from a firing position on the southeast side of the bridge. Bravo Company is next. With three tanks out in front, it will charge across the Euphrates Bridge and then immediately jog right and head north along the eastern outskirts of town. Charlie Company is supposed to stay right on the heels of Bravo as they wind around to the east. They are supposed to get up to the north, and, and then the two of them are supposed to hold and allow the tanks to come through from the rear. Tanks are a critical part of the plan. They protect the Amtraks carrying the infantrymen. Amtraks are actually amphibious assault vehicles. They're made to float. The armor is really just two inches of aluminum. 
So while an Amtrak can repel most small arms fire, it is highly vulnerable to RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades. One shot would take us out. You know, we're an aluminum vehicle, so it's kind of like driving a big beer can. But tanks can absorb all types of fire and deliver devastation in return. So they usually send the enemy scrambling. They'll need to be in the lead at all times for this plan to work smoothly. But no one could have foreseen that a misdirected army maintenance convoy would inadvertently spoil the element of surprise and whip the city into a frenzy ahead of time. Now, as survivors of that convoy are being rescued and news gets back to high-level Marine commanders that an unknown number of U.S. soldiers might be prisoners of war, getting 1st Battalion 2nd Marines into Nazaria takes on a new sense of urgency. The bridges need to be secured anyway, um, so they viewed it as a, an opportunity to save the soldiers while they were still in the area, knowing that they may very well get whisked away and who knows what. So they made a hard decision to, uh, to launch us into the attack quicker than they had intended, and uh, I think for good reason. But the timing couldn't be worse, because Alpha and Charlie companies are now out of their vehicles looking for enemy fighters in roadside buildings, and the tanks have gone to the rear to refuel. They are critically low on gas after an all-night trek. But even with his tanks refueling, under pressure to get his Marines into the city as quickly as possible, Battalion Commander Lieutenant Colonel Rick Grabowski orders his companies to move out. Bravo will now lead the way. Basically, that was game on. We're going in. At this point, the Marine Battalion has lost the element of surprise. It's attacking without its tanks, and unknown to the Marines, Thousands of fanatical Fedayeen fighters and Ba'ath Party loyalists have infiltrated Nazaria in recent days. They have taken control of the city, intimidated the residents, stockpiled weapons, and set up fighting positions. The fog of war is rolling in. For the 1,300 men of 1st Battalion 2nd Marines, the struggle for the bridges of Nazaria will be one of the worst street fights in history. March 23rd, 2003, 11 a.m. Nazaria, Iraq, just north of the Euphrates River Bridge. The tanks and Amtraks of Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines, some 300 men, are squeezing their way down a narrow side street en route to Nazaria's eastern limit. You could have reached out and touched the buildings, they were so close. All someone has to do is go up on top of, of one of the roofs, take a pop shot with an RPG and disappear. It's very, very, very tough to fight in an environment like that, especially if you are enclosed in a vehicle. The company, along with the battalion commander and his forward command element, is spearheading a mission to seize bridges at both ends of the city. The road between the bridges is a potential ambush alley, so the Marines have opted to skirt the city to the east and attempt to reach the second bridge with less resistance. But when they pour off the end of the Euphrates Bridge at high speed, they miss their turn, the road they planned to take to skirt the eastern edge of town. Even if they could have made that right, it would have been really hard to make. They would have had to make it at slow speed. So as it was, uh, speed was important. So they, they overshot it a little bit. They turned right a little bit later. And uh, that's when I lost sight of them. Now, as the Bravo Company vehicles take this alternate roadway east, Iraqi fighters open up with punishing fire from all directions. On rooftops, in, you know, from windows, uh, behind fences, it was a constant. As the embattled Bravo vehicles finally reach the eastern edge of town, they break free of the menacing rows of neighborhood buildings onto what looks like a hard dirt surface. Seconds later, the lead tanks, along with the battalion commander's communications vehicle and a few others, sink to the tops of their tractor treads in a foul soup of loose mud and human excrement. What had appeared to be a solid dirt surface was actually the dried top crust of a deep sewage bog. 
The harder the heavy tanks and Amtraks try to reverse out of the smelly muck, the deeper they sink. And for the infantrymen looking on, the sight of the tanks out of commission is chilling. When you see a tank, um, you know, down, it, it, it does cause you to think, well, what do I do next? Iraqi fighters see the vehicles become stranded and quickly pour on AK-47 and RPG fire. Infantrymen scramble from the mired Amtraks to cover Marines working to get the vehicles unstuck. They rush to the corners of nearby buildings and unleash vicious fire on anything that looks threatened. And it's soon clear that the enemy fighters are not all male or even adult. You would see a woman and a man and a child standing up waving. And when you blink or if you turn your eyes, the man is you know, pulling up an AK-47 from behind his back, and you have to engage. Lieutenant Colonel Rick Grabowski tries to radio Charlie Company to tell them not to follow, but to push directly to the northern bridge. But high-voltage power lines overhead are blocking the signals. Back at the Euphrates River, Alpha Company crosses the bridge. Then it carries out its part of the plan by setting up a defensive position north of it, facing west toward the bulk of the city. We're probably there about five minutes, five to eight minutes, uh, when it just seemed like the entire world exploded. Hundreds of armed Iraqis seem to burst from the woodwork and bum rush the Marines. You just see waves of people starting to move towards your position. They have people running from the houses, they have people jumping right out in the road and trying to take a knee with an RPG to shoot the AAVs. Fire was pinging off all of the AAVs. It's coming from the sides of each of the buildings. It's coming from the tops of the buildings. The infantry are now getting into whatever type of covered positions until they can figure out what's going on. You can see them running and massing in the alleys. They were plain clothes, a headdress, the only way you knew that they were bad guys was they all had AK-47s. They were all armed to the teeth. A chief concern for company commander Mike Brooks is that his men not harm innocent civilians. Several seem to be scurrying for cover, surprised by this initial onslaught. Distinguishing combatant from non-combatant isn't always easy. While the firefight is raging, we had a man, his wife, and he's holding an infant in his arms. And they're sitting on a balcony 100 meters in front of us just observing the fight. And you think, that guy could very well be, you know, a forward observer or the commander of this whole thing. He looks sinister, to be honest with you. But I, I wasn't about to clear anybody to engage those people just suspecting that they might have been the commander or something else. It's just, to me, unless it was clear, it just wasn't worth taking the chance. It isn't long before the Iraqis begin attempting suicide charges with automobiles, and they seem to be using the most innocent-looking vehicles they can find. Coming up an alleyway, there's an ambulance, and it's got its siren flashing, it's got the red stripe down, you see the C on the side, everything, and it is driving at a high rate of speed right towards my vehicle. We fired a couple of warning shots, the ambulance didn't stop, he was still coming straight at our position, fired straight into the cab. The ambulance ended up stopping. I remember just seeing him just waste that ambulance because they were using it against him. The back end of that ambulance flew open, and five or six guys clad in black with AK-47s jumped out the back end of that ambulance. That was enough to make other younger Marines look and say, rules of engagement. What are we firing at? What are we not firing at? They're using ambulances and they're using everything else to cover their own movement. As Alpha Company battles to beat back enemy attacks from the west, north, and east, Charlie Company, last in the battalion column, crests the Euphrates Bridge from the south and reaches the fight. It's Charlie Company's job to take the northern bridge, two and a half miles ahead at the other end of Ambush Alley. The Battle of Nazaria is already ugly, and for the men of Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines, it's about to become desperate.
March 23, 2003. Euphrates River Bridge, Nazaria, Iraq. 12 p.m. The men of Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines, commanded by Captain Dan Whitnam, are crossing the bridge into the Battle of Nazaria. Alpha Company is already in the fight, some 500 yards ahead. The plan of attack calls for Charlie Company to secure a second bridge two and a half miles ahead at the other end of Ambush Alley. They are to follow Bravo Company to get there. The two companies are to cross the Euphrates Bridge, jog right, and sweep north around the eastern edge of town. Right now, we're at a decision point. The company commander, he's, he's looking off to the east, trying to, trying to look for Bravo Company. That's who we're supposed to be following. He can't see him. Captain Whitnam has no idea that Bravo is bogged down in mud and under attack by Iraqi fighters on the eastern side of town. High power lines are interfering with radio signals, so the two companies cannot communicate. He makes a decision, hey, they must have pushed up uh, the, main, the main highway there, and they must be up close to the northern bridge by now. We gotta get there and help them. The captain orders his Amtraks to forget about trying to cut around the eastern side of town and to push straight up Ambush Alley toward the northern bridge. The 11 Amtraks of Charlie Company rev their engines and go for it. Soon after, rounds start pinging off the sides of the vehicles. Once you start taking fire, Marines don't tend to stay down in the hole. And, you know, as I turned around, Staff Sergeant Jordan was laying on the top of the vehicle firing rounds, even though I'm saying, you know, Staff Sergeant, get in the vehicle. It's no good. Then quickly, the shooting surges to a torrent of rifle and machine gun fire. We're starting to come through the city, and we're taking fire from everywhere. People running across the street, from behind us, from on top. We're on 10 feet above the ground, so you see a lot of stuff being on top of a track. Infantryman Corporal Kevin Doughty and his fire team are inside Amtrak number C211. I had one of my machine guns up there, and he just started to let loose. Tried to calm him down, conserve his ammo. I said, only shoot at what you know. He kept shooting, so obviously there was quite a big one on. The driver of the first vehicle in front is then Lance Corporal Ed Castleberry. I'm pushing, I'm pushing hard, you know, trying to get, just get through. Everybody in the back's just pooping and hollering and just shooting like crazy, you know, because we have a hatch open and there's 10 infantry guys with machine guns standing out top, pulling people down. There's people running in from alleys, you know, shooting RPGs at us. Gunfire tracer rounds going off. I'm just thinking, wow, this is really, you know, surreal to me. Pressing his vehicle up the embattled roadway, Lance Corporal Castleberry is stunned to see two suicidal fetying fighters dash into the street directly in front of his vehicle. They were expecting to shoot their RPG at us, they would stop us, and then they could just reload and just kill us. Both Fetiyin RPG shooters let loose their rockets at point-blank range. One RPG shot straight as an arrow, and it went below where we were at. And the other one shot off like a corkscrew, just, you know, into nowhere. Then, Castleberry retaliates against one of the Iraqis with the most lethal weapon at his disposal, his Amtrak. He was trying to reload, and I, just, I gunned it, and I clipped him. He ran forward, and I just hit him with 27 tons of, of death. Minutes later, the Charlie Company Amtraks finally arrive at the Northern Bridge. No Marines have been killed, and the Amtraks have escaped serious damage. But before they all make it across, tragedy strikes. The second to last vehicle, Charlie 211, takes an RPG round in the side. 
Corporal Kevin Dowdy is inside the vehicle. I look over to on the other side of the track and I see Corporal Glass. First I see his leg, which is only halfway there, and then I see his face. And it's like, nah, I didn't just see that. Inside the Amtrak, Dowdy rushes to the aid of Corporal Glass and three other wounded Marines as the disabled vehicle limps its way the last few hundred yards across the bridge. The track was burning when it was coming over the you know bridge. The engine was still intact and everything, so it was still operational, but it was whole side was on fire. As soon as it stopped, you know, Marines just started piling out of it, and that thing burnt to the ground. The other 200-plus infantrymen of Charlie Company take up hasty fighting positions on both sides of the roadway. Then we just started getting bombarded with a, a massive amount of artillery, small arms fire, RPG. I mean, anything you can think of, they were throwing at us because we were just sitting ducks right there. Bravo Company is nowhere in sight, but it's Charlie Company's mission to secure this bridge. They must stay here. Unfortunately, the troubles for Charlie Company have only just begun. These men are about to become victims of the most horrific tragedy of Operation Iraqi Freedom. March 23, 2003. 12.30 p.m. Nazaria, Iraq. The three companies of 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines are shrouded in the murky fog of war, and they're fighting for their lives. Bravo Company is on the east side of town and attempting to fight its way north, but some of its vehicles have become mired in a sewage bog, and high-voltage power lines overhead are causing radio communication problems. Alpha Company has seized and is trying to hold the bridge over the Euphrates River at the south end of town. But it's in a desperate fight and has its hands full. And now, Charlie Company has battled its way up Ambush Alley and crossed a bridge at the north end of town. It's under mortar and artillery fire. The Iraqis have prepared to defend the bridge, so dozens of enemy mortarmen in hidden positions hundreds of meters away, have the area just north of the bridge, Charlie Company's current position, zeroed in. They're also using RPGs as cheap mortars, launching them high into the air. They're lobbing them in at max range. They know our max effective range for, for an M16 is 550 meters, and they're staying out of that. Then First Lieutenant Ben Reed is the company's weapons platoon commander and fire support team leader. The three 60-millimeter mortars in the company are under his command. My only thought at that point was, hey, I just got to get my mortarman firing. Pick out a target and get those guns up and get them dropping. And I could see the mortarman, they were just <laughs> They were like almost melting the tubes, you know, dropping so many, getting them off all they could trying to kill the enemy, you know, because we were getting hit pretty, pretty good at this time. Probably saved a lot of lives. The officer in charge of calling in artillery support is 2nd Lieutenant Fred Pokorny, a 31-year-old prior enlisted Marine from Nevada. Since arriving at the Northern Bridge, he's been having trouble reaching the artilleryman on the radio. Now, he runs over and reports to Reed that he's finally made radio contact with the artilleryman and that he's called in some fire missions. I said, all right, good to go. And uh, just as I turned back to spot for, for uh, some rounds that my mortarman had just dropped, uh, something, something big blew up behind us. The ear piercing sounded like something just hitting, slamming down on the concrete. An indirect explosive round of some sort has made a direct hit on the mortar squad's position. Reed is kneeling, and his arm is slammed against the roadside embankment. I said, damn it, I think my arm's broken. And uh, it wasn't broken, but I thought it might be because I couldn't move it. The Marine right behind me, Corporal Gonzalez, he said, that's too bad, sir. And, and you could hear it in his voice. You, you know, he just, he was not in the same shape that he had been, you know, seconds before. You could hear some moaning and, and uh, it just wasn't a good situation. The blast takes three lives, including those of Second Lieutenant Fred Pokorny, 
and reads platoon sergeant, Staff Sergeant Philip Jordan. He had been making several runs under, under some of that fire back and forth, shuttling ammo down to us. I wanted to go get the corpsman, so I turn to the north and I start to run to where my other two mortars are, the, the, the platoon corpsman's there with those mortars. And uh, I don't know how far I got, probably 15, 20 feet. And uh, one second I'm running, the next one, my face is just slammed into the dirt. A second explosive shell blows Reed to the ground. I mean, it was like slow-mo, just the blood started to pool in the dirt uh, right there. And I started to get up and just kind of fell back down. And, and I remember thinking, you know, this is it. You know, how's this work? You know, I just, do I just lay here and die or what, you know? And I can't explain it, but for some reason, I ended up getting up. Reed gets up and continues to try to find help for his wounded Marines. The right side of his face is riddled with shrapnel. Later, Reed has to ask his company gunnery sergeant if his eye is still in place. But the most devastating blow to the young officer and to Charlie Company as a whole on this day has yet to come. Around 1 p.m., a forward air controller with Bravo Company, two miles south of Charlie's position, makes radio contact with two Air Force A-10 fighter bombers over an emergency frequency. The job of a forward air controller is to call in fire missions from aircraft to support infantrymen on the ground. As the A-10s reach Nazaria, they spot the Charlie Company Amtraks north of the Saddam Canal Bridge, but mistake them for enemy vehicles. The pilots report the sighting to the Bravo Air Controller. The controller and the other commanders in the vicinity have no clue that Marine forces have made it that far north. They think Charlie Company is still south of their position. Based on the information the controller has at hand in the fog of battle, he concludes that the vehicles the A-10s have spotted must be an Iraqi mechanized unit on its way into town to kill Marines. So he clears the A-10s to open fire. We see an A-10 flying around, and uh, we're thinking, OK, great, cool. We've got somebody helping us out. Well, actually, I know it's kind of shooting in the wrong direction. The A-10s unleash slashing barrages of fire from their 30 millimeter Gatling guns. I remember just going, Jesus. Green sparks just impacted from, uh, I'm assuming, from its 30 millimeter. And uh, everybody just took off and scattered. It fires so many rounds at one time, it's not like a machine gun. You can hear the, you know, rat-tat-tat. -tat. It's just whoop, all at one time. It, it, it showers a pretty wide area with depleted uranium rounds, and whatever's in that area is dead. In this tragic case, it's 300 U.S. Marines and their vehicles that are in the kill zone. The A-10 fire kills at least one Marine and wounds several more. There's so many casualties at this point that if we don't get them to medical attention, they will die. Charlie Company Marines load the wounded onto six Amtraks and point the vehicles back south toward Ambush Alley. They're going from one kill zone to another. And the A-10s, who still think the Amtraks are enemy vehicles, are lining up for the final blow. March 23rd, 2003, 1.30 p.m. Ambush Alley, Nazaria, Iraq. Six Amtraks full of wounded men from Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines, are rushing south from the Saddam Canal Bridge, headed for an aid station. And through tragic and bizarre circumstances, they are under attack by two U.S. Air Force A-10 fighter bombers. This disastrous occurrence has come about through a classic illustration of the adage, the fog of war. When A-10 fighter bombers arrived over Nazaria to support the Marines, they spotted what they believed to be enemy vehicles and dismounted troops north of the Saddam Canal Bridge. The pilots reported the sighting to the Bravo Company forward air controller. Charlie Company doesn't have an air controller of its own. Radio communications between companies have been sketchy the entire battle, 
and the forward air controller with Bravo has no idea that Charlie Company has made it up to the northern bridge. As the Amtraks head south, he thinks the vehicles are Iraqis on the attack, so he clears the A-10s to open fire. Lance Corporal Ed Castleberry is driving one of the vehicles. I'm following a track, and right in front of that thing, just, it goes. I see a white flash. You know, something hits the top of it. I just see the inside of it. You know, half of the Amtrak blew out the side. Everybody in the back, pieces, people, blown. The, the 27 tons of, of steel, of, of aluminum steel, blew three feet in the air. That's a big explosion. Then a second Amtrak is hit catastrophically. Lance Corporal Castleberry's vehicle, just 20 yards away, is luckier. A 30 millimeter round simply penetrates the transmission and Castleberry loses steering. But the young Marine manages to guide the disabled track toward the courtyard of an Iraqi home at the side of the road. The structure will soon earn the nickname, the Alamo. Marines are starting to go inside. They're grabbing, you know, the wounded out of the back. You know, they're hobbling them in there. You know, we're, we're providing cover fire for them. The 12 Marines are in the worst crossfire they can imagine, a three-dimensional storm of bullets. You know, some guys in some buildings across the road trying to shoot at us. They, you know, been shooting at us the whole time through at Michelle, but now they had us, you know, as targets. The Marines kick in the door of the house and gently stage the bleeding men in covered positions on the bottom floor. From there, they scramble to the rooftop, cover all corners, and open fire to hold off dozens of Fedayeen attackers. They're popping around corners. They're trying to, you know, creep their way up the block, you know, trying to get a better shot at us. You know, there's the machine gun pit, just constantly, you know, we sh keep shooting it. It becomes a ferocious three-hour gun battle with several close calls. I actually got grazed on the side of the head for the bullet, you know, hit my Kevlar. There was another kid who got his Kevlar shot off of his head, sitting there shooting, and, a, and an enemy bullet went, <laughs> hit him in the front. His Kevlar just flew off his head. I was like, hey, can you guys pass me that? Real calm. I was like, yeah, buddy. Yeah. For one Marine, the gunfight becomes a living nightmare when he shoots an Iraqi assailant who slumps against a wall in an upright position. He gets shot, and he, he dies. He dies with his eyes open, staring at, at this guy. And it, you know, it's his little post. It's his area of responsibility. It's the corner of the house. And he's freaking out. This guy looks like he's still staring at me. He's been staring at him for like two hours. Because <laughs> he, was, he was having a hard time up there. And he was just like, he just keeps looking at me. Finally, somebody else had to go over there and just shoot that guy down until he just quit looking at him. Every able-bodied Marine is needed in the fight. So the wounded down below are caring for each other the best they can. Some of the wounded, like Trevino, was holding was holding uh, Elliot's neck, and Elliot was holding Trevino's head, and they were laying on his ankle, and, you know, trying to apply pressure to these wounds. You know, so they wouldn't bleed out, you know. And we're still trying to figure out how the heck we're gonna get them out of here. No one knows where the embattled Marines are located, or if they're dead or alive. They do have a radio, but the batteries are almost gone. Castleberry eventually gets a weak signal through to his platoon commander, Lieutenant Connor Tracy, who's still back at the northern bridge. So I hear static transmission of the radio, and all I really got was the name Castleberry. I could hear him fine because he had, you know, a lot of a lot of signal coming into my radio. So I told Castleberry, click one for yes, key twice for no. I think my first question was, are you south of our bridge? And it was yes. And then, no, are you north of the southern bridge? And doing that, I, I kind of pieced together that he was in the city. By this time, the tanks have returned from refueling and have already helped Alpha Company drive off its attackers. When the tanks came in with their main gun round, they were, they were able to take out some of the, the fortified buildings. 
You could hear the cheer erupt from the Marines. Tank Commander Major Bill Peoples gets word of the Marines trapped in the Alamo. He and his XO took off right down Ambush Alley. Just two tanks, unsupported, uh, right up that three mile stretch into God knows what. Peoples drives his tank to the house, turns his turret to the side to make room on top, and is able to transport all of the Alamo's wounded to safety. Later, Castleberry and the other able-bodied Marines catch a ride back to the Northern Bridge in a caravan of Humvees. It's a wall lit out of the city, a wall of lead. Like, there is just, we're shooting every bit of ammo we have left, just so, you know, we can make it out of the town. We only had, you know, a few miles to go. The worst of the day's fight is over. The tanks, along with helicopter gunships, soon drive off most of the remaining attackers for the time being. The Iraqis have suffered hundreds of casualties. Tank retrievers finally reach Bravo Company on the east side of town and pull them out of the muck. And many Alpha Company Marines move up Ambush Alley to help pick up the pieces of Charlie Company. When we got over the top of the northern bridge, I can only imagine that's what the Castle Rain Pass looked like in 1942 when it, the Germans hit the Americans because there were burning vehicles. North of the bridge, we saw a track right in the middle of the road completely split open. And that was that was the third track that I saw that was burning or, or destroyed. I see gear all over the place. I see flak jackets burnt or ripped to shreds. People were like zombies wandering around. Uh, we had one Marine that was running up to us that just kept screaming over and over again, did you see what happened to us? Did you see what happened to us? A total of 18 Charlie Company Marines are dead and 24 are wounded. You feel, you feel pain and, and uh, anger at the same time. Senior leaders do their best to comfort the grieving young men around them. My gunny, and uh, he came up and gave me, you know, just just grabbed me, you know, and embraced me, and, and that's when I, you know, I realized, you know, I felt safe, and I was, it was, uh, it was a real emotional moment for me. First Battalion, Second Marines has suffered, but its men have accomplished their mission of seizing the bridges at both ends of Ambush Alley. By the end of the day, when the sun went down, we had secured our two bridges in our mission. So regardless of how much success they had from 8 in the morning until 13, 1400, 1500 in the afternoon, um, by the end of the day, the Marine Corps, its battalions, its fighting units had accomplished their mission, opened up the road we were supposed to open up, and were pushing forces north. Even so, for the men who fought and watched their friends die in the Battle of Nazaria, it will take years to fully come to terms with it. Nobody set out to get anybody hurt. You know, everybody was doing what they thought was the right thing to do. Uh, and there were problems, there was a lot of friction. But the thing that I hope that history remembers is it wasn't it wasn't the battalion commander or a company commander or the general, you know, that, that ultimately made us successful. It was, it was uh, you know, that Lance Corporal machine gunner or that PFC grenadier or that fire team leader, that sergeant, making calls on the spot, looking out for the welfare of his Marines that ultimately carried the day. The guy that got no glory for it, he got no combat award, he got, uh, he got nothing. Uh, except the, you know, the, the bad memories to live with. Give him that recognition that he deserves. <laughs>